I have the amazing Josh Payne with me today. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this. Absolutely. So uh, we, we tried to get you on a while ago at SSPT Live 2019, and you, you did a talk at SSPT Live, and essentially you are basically like the go-to guy for, for concierge physical therapy at the moment. And for those people who don't, have never heard of what concierge PT is, let's just start with just defining what that means and, and actually like what it, what it is to practice concierge PT, just for people so they have, I know it's when we talk about it, they, they know what we're talking about. Yeah. So, so really, um, I can't remember the exact definition off the top of my head that I gave it SSPT live, but it's basically individualized one-on-one care, um, for fee for service given in, given to a patient in their home or office. How does that differ than just like classic in-home PT? Yeah. So, I mean, classic in-home PT obviously in most cases uses insurance. Um, but the biggest difference between, this model and and like a classic in-home PT or even a mobile PT is concierge PT and a, and a lot of concierge physical therapists like myself are truly actually adopting the concierge healthcare model. And that is really um, being more of a wellness service, which is, which is honestly to me a lot of fun. Um, right. And being, a more, being more wellness service, but then also having subscription plans for the patients to subscribe to. And to see you on a more long-term basis, and so lots of times. Let's talk more about that. When you say subscription yeah, plans, what does what does that mean? Subscription plans. So um, basically, monthly. Um, the majority of my patients are on monthly plans. Um, okay. There, I do have a few that have committed to to a to a basically a year-long monthly program. But pretty much everybody goes from month to month um, without many wanting to leave anytime soon. Okay. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so. Take me through that that first conversation. No, let's go. Let's go back a step. Like, okay, let's talk, let's okay. So that's what concierge PTs. Let's talk about you for a second. How you got into this model, and then we'll sort of go a little bit deeper into like the nuances of concierge PT and 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 how somebody can essentially decide whether or not that you know that pathway is right for them. So, like, rewind a second. I I know your story. I've read your story. It's on your site as well. Um, and I found your new site, the, the Kajabi one, the, the coach, the concierge PT coaching one, yeah, yeah. which I see is, is, uh, is in the works, which is awesome. Um, so your story is there as well, but why don't you share with us how you arrived at concierge PT and where you started and why you decided to go this route? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so for those of you that, that don't know me, basically I, I had, this is the, this is the, almost the short story, but I had basically six jobs in four years. Um, I graduated in May, 2013 from Texas tech university. And um, I immediately started out now patient. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big football and basketball guy. That's what I played in, in middle school, high school. And I was like, hey, you know, I want to work with athletes like a lot of us PTs. And I went into outpatient ortho, um, quickly realized that the clinic that I was working at was not everything that I dreamed it would be. I actually primarily worked with feet, um, people who had specific uh, problems with um, plantar fascia and different things like that. How many patients were you treating in an hour in your first job? I was in, oh, in an hour, I was typically seeing around three in an hour. Okay. Um, a right. typical day was around 25. And now right. that's now, and now I see less than that in a week. So, right. um, <laughs> but, the, but the point being is I, I, I jumped around from job to job to job. I, I, I did not like that ortho job. I immediately went into home health. And then from there, I actually opened up my own practice inside of a lifetime fitness. Then I went okay. back to home health. I jumped around six jobs in four years before I came to the conclusion that I had to make a change. Is that Lifetime Athletic? Is that the same company or is it a different company? It is same company. Okay, yeah. I'm doing I'm doing a workshop at Lifetime Athletic on the 15th this month for uh, for their entire training staff on uh, mobility stuff. So that's kind of interesting. Oh that my gosh, that's place. amazing. That's cool. All right. So go ahead. So you, you six, I think I heard you correctly. I think you said six jobs in four years, which may, which may be a, a, a record. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was incredible. You know, my wife is a physical therapist too. And she just kept telling me, Josh, like you got to stick with something. Your resume is, is just crazy. Um, and the funny thing is people still always hired me. They had no problem hiring me, even though I had six, six jobs in four years, but right. Usually the thing is like, right? Exactly. But here, here's the realization that I came to in that I was not happy in what I was doing. I was actually miserable in what I was doing. I was always trying to search for like, gosh, what, what was this area in physical therapy that I was passionate about and that I can make a true impact in? 
And I realized that what I was actually doing was I was chasing uh, different, different settings, um, more money. I was chasing, uh, you know, better mentors. I was chasing all of these things, which are all, all great things. Maybe besides, you know, don't make the same mistakes and continue to chase money like I was. But, but here's the bottom line is I was chasing all of these external factors that really now, were me, not making me Let me just pause here and say, did, did your life improve throughout that time where you were making more money? Like, cause I know a lot of PTs, like I'm in the process of hiring a PT right now. And one of the things that just shocks me sometimes is these young clinicians who are maybe out a year or two and what they're actually asking for. And I, you know, I know what, what the role is, is I don't want to put quote, air quotes around this worth or what the, what the actual rate is or what the salary should be one or two years out. Uh, but I got clinicians coming in here that are asking me for $10,000 more than I made my first year out. And there's almost like this shift, like among young clinicians, almost like it's, it's the employer's responsibility to pay off the debt that we all got into. <laughs> you know, it's like you come out, you got 150 grand in debt and you're like, all right, it's time for someone else to pay this off for me. And so we keep chasing that dollar bill thinking, okay, I'm going to make more and more money to pay off the debt and free myself and that kind of thing. But the reality is that a lot of us find out that, that it doesn't really work that way and it didn't work that way for you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I do think that there are are almost unreasonable expectations coming out of school. And, and I was included in, in them. Um, I, I had no concept of money when I first came out of school. My first job was for 63,000 at an outpatient clinic and I thought I was gonna be rich and, and I clearly found out that doesn't go as far as you might think. Yeah. Math off. kicked in, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly, so I, I agree with you 100%, um, but, but no, really, you know, those big jumps that, that I made you know, really, it, it, it didn't help me to pay off my student loans faster. It, it didn't help. Yeah, it maybe helped a little bit more with quality of life. Um, but, but yeah, it really, really didn't. And, and I was just really dissatisfied still. And, I, and I'll tell you, like at one point, I was, I was making well, you know, good six figures with home health, but I was still dissatisfied with, with what I was doing completely. But let's pause for a second. So it, what, at, at face value, home health and concierge look similar, but there's a, there's a difference between the two in, in terms of control. Yeah. There's a massive difference. Okay. Um, so I have more, I have more control of my time, which is, which is one amazing thing. And that's why I, I learned to love it is, um, you know, I could see four patients in a day and do very well mm -hmm. and, and spend an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and a half with a client if I wanted to. Um, you know, I could go in the backyard and practice some chipping in, in a, in a, in a patient's backyard with them because I'm terrible at golf. Like, like I could do those things with my patients now. And I love the fact that I no longer felt like I was in a rush. Right. So once I started to get to that point in concierge physical therapy, I became obsessed about making this a full-time position for me, my own company. And that's when it all really started to happen. You know, it's interesting. There's this shift that happens in life, I think, with all of us, where we start to realize that there's the, the, two, the two things, the two, um, let's say commodities, but the, 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 the two attributes that we all have, time and money. And I, I'll put energy in, and I basically teach there's four, time, money, energy, and information. And that when we're young, we've got a lot of time and a lot of energy, and we end up trading our time and energy for money and information, you know, so that as we get older, we have more money, we have more information, right? We, we know more, but we have less time and less energy. And as, as we get to a, almost like a tipping point or like a, almost like a wall where we realize we can no longer move forward in that same direction and we have to almost reverse the process and give up something in order to get our time and our energy back. And I think the, the happiness quotient really lives in the time and energy. The more time and energy you have, the happier you are. The more money and information you have, sure, the more assets you have, but without the time and energy, it, it, you don't feel fulfilled. And that's kind of like what I'm hearing from you. 100% like yeah. time. I, I have realized that I'm now about to turn 32 and, and I think you just described me in a nutshell. And, <laughs> but now that I've realized like time, I have a seven month old little boy named Hudson at home now and time is everything, man. Time yeah. is absolutely everything. So uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so what was the, what was the moment? What was the, uh, what was the blink that sort of like went from, I can't do this to, I can do this. I know your wife was involved in that moment. What happened? You know, it, well, first, first off, it all, it all started with one miserable kind of lonely night where I was sitting in a small office and I was looking at three Oasis documents 
And I decided that night, whatever it was, is I, I just told myself, I was like, I'm not doing these things tonight. I don't care if they fire me. I'm not doing them tonight. I'm going to go see my wife and we're going to have a good night. We're going to actually have dinner together. Let's do this. And I packed up my bag and I went, went there and my, my wife, you know, I walked through the door and I told this at SSPT live as I walked through the door and I immediately start complaining of those documents that I just decided not to do. And my wife looks at me really, really sternly. And she's like, Josh, are you ever going to find happiness in your career as a PT? And, and she had never asked me that before. Like it came out of nowhere, but clearly right. she had been thinking it a long time, right? right? And, and uh, it just really took me back. And, and honestly, it was that moment that changed everything for me because that's when I basically dedicated myself and said, look, I'm in a new marriage. I don't want that to affect my marriage. I don't want to be miserable in what I'm doing. I want to find happiness in what I'm doing. And, and it was that shift. Honestly, it was that one small question my wife asked me that shifted everything. And I put all of my effort, all of my time. Um, I can, I, I tend to get very obsessed over things when I get really, um, pumped up about them. And so I put all of my efforts into doing that. And well, you know, I'll say it wasn't easy, but that's, that was the shift. That was the moment. Right. For me. How did you start? What was the first thing you did? First thing I did, um, was I contacted clients that I felt that, uh, that I had great relationships with in the past, okay. um, just to tell them about what I was doing. Um, you know, we all have those clients that, uh, you know, two, three years ago, we, we may have put them in our phones and we're like, yeah, I love that patient. And so I just, I just let them know, Hey, you know, I didn't have any non-competes. So it was just like, Hey, this is what I'm doing, um, in this, in this new city. And, and just wanted to let you know about it. That was my first step. Okay. Um, and from, from there, I basically had to, I basically utilized my, my family and friends kind of circle and I, I basically reached out to them. I call it activating your inner circle. That's what I teach. Okay. People. <laughs> um, okay. I like that. Literally I activated my inner circle and I reached out to them and, and from there I got some leads and I, I honestly just from doing those two things had about two to three patients on my schedule that I started with and that's okay. where it all began. Okay. And what did, if you don't mind my asking, what did you, when you first started, what did you charge? Oh my goodness. Good question. Um, it's so embarrassing, but <laughs> let me, let me, let me let you understand that I was making $52 per visit in home health. Okay. So, so when my wife asked me that question, I was like, look, Hey, if I can get paid $75 cash for a visit in the for home, an hour, for an hour, we'll be doing great. Yes. And, and so my, my first few clients, I charged $75 a visit and it, all it took was a few saying, wow, you are severely undercharging yourself. Right. Um, it was, it, I literally got that response that I moved to 125 pretty quickly. Okay. And what, what's the, what's the going range now for, for concierge? I charge $175 per visit. Um, okay. but I think, I think the average range for most people that I hear in pretty much most cities and towns across the nation is between 150 and 200, but you, you go to place, you, you know, you go to places like New York and I, I know, I know PTs that are charging upwards of 300 or more. Um, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a guy here in Jer I'm in Jersey in Madison and there's a, there's a guy, he doesn't do concierge, but he does one-on-one -on -one cash and he's charging 300 a visit. He's a good PT though. I mean, like he, like you, like I'm kind of like, you know, put your, put your money where your mouth is kind of thing. Like you've got to be able to, you know, you got to be able to, 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 to put up or shut up when it comes to, if you're charging that much, you got to be able to deliver. And you know, there's, I, I do think there is a trend of, again, it, I think, I feel like almost like it goes along with this whole, asking for more than your value is in that moment. And I think a lot of young clinicians who decide to go the cash pay route, they start charging 250, 300, but there's a mismatch between what they're charging and their ability to deliver. And I'm not saying that that is a trend. I'm just saying that, that there are some clinicians I think that get themselves into trouble there um, where, you know, I, I just don't think there's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a real moral or ethics behind just charging more for charging sake versus being able to deliver that value. And you don't have to be the best, like, you know, you don't have to be a master manual therapist. You don't have to be like OCS, SCS, FAO, MPT. I mean, that's not what I mean. It's just that you've got to be able to deliver that one-on-one -on -one care. And for some people, you know, for Aunt Sally, that may just be taking a walk around the block. But if that is, if that is a 10 value for her, delivering that is so key. Absolutely. But, but I will agree with you. I think it's a dangerous trend going on in the cash PT world. Um, yeah. We've got to come out guns a blazing because that's what we got to do to because we we need to feel value 
for ourselves. And one thing that I ask a lot of my coaching students is, what would you pay to see yourself? And really, really, really think about that question. I love that fucking question. <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. I'm going to a- ask that question of my next interviewee. <laughs> it, it, it like, but, but really like actually think about it. What yeah. would you pay to see yourself? Like it, right when you really think about it, that is a phenomenal question. Would you pay 175? Okay. You want to charge 250 out of the gates? Would you pay that to see yourself? Uh-huh. If you wouldn't, that's not a great place to start. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, that's so a simple way to do it. You you basically put up your concierge shingle. You started to to grow the business by activating your friends and family network. And then at, at what point in time did you sort of decide, okay, I have enough patients? Like, like how how many is enough in concierge? What what is what is the goal? with your volume to be able to create a business that's sustainable? Because obviously there's some churn along the way at some point in time. So how do you of fill course. in those patients that are, that are, that are actually, I mean, like I, I understand that because you're incorporating the wellness, you get this longevity, right? People are not just coming to see you for, P, for a plan of care and then they're gone. It's a partnership in health, which is a totally different mindset. So people stick around for a hell of a lot longer. But nonetheless, like, like what's the volume that you need to feel comfortable doing this? Yeah. So I think it's different for everybody. Um, for me, I, I, I like, I, I like taking risks, especially when it involves, um, you know, me finding happiness and, and that, that in turn, um, you know, my wife was on board with that because all she wanted me to find was happiness in my career as well. So for me, it was, it was five consistent clients. That's really all it was. That's it. Um, one, once I hit that point, which did take a lot of marketing and grinding and getting out into the community just to reach that five. Um, that's, that's all it was for me. And I went down to part-time in home health from there with those five clients on the side. I quickly realized that, you know, I got to around six, seven, but I really wasn't climbing too high after that for, the, for those months that I was doing part-time home health. And I just completely cut the ties and was like, I had this conversation with my wife. I was like, hey, babe, I'm not making too much traction. I, I need more time. I'm going to quit. Just trust me. I'm going to make this thing work. <laughs> <laughs> And we, and, and we did it. And honestly, that was one of the main moments that really accelerated me because then, you know, there was no reason for me not to get out into the community more and do more and do more workshops and free talks and free screens. Like, yeah. Let's, let's talk about reason. what worked in, in that growth. Absolutely. Like, what, Absolutely. What yep. major strategies that you use to build your practice? Well, I think, I think number one, I know this is cliche, but I want you, I want, you know, your listeners to understand this is, is if you can be a phenomenal networker, you can grow a business. Um, because I truly believe a service-based business like physical therapy, like fee-for-service physical therapy, the best way to cont- to grow it from the very beginning is to build a base in your community. So I, I built a base in my community just by by networking events, um, you know, uh, entrepreneur happy hours, small business happy hours. Okay. Uh, th- those t- types of different events. Luckily, Denver has a ton of those events. It's such a like business and entrepreneurial friendly city um, that, oh my God, I mean, there's small business week, there's entrepreneur week, there's this, there's that, there's these networking groups, oh, there's wow. these opportunities for, for you to, to talk in front of these networking groups. I mean, there's so many things that I was able to do in those first few months of business. And, and how I'm, does that conversation go? Like if you're, you're meeting some, some human being, they ostensibly have some business that is unrelated to yours. What, what does that sound like? Um, so that that person then becomes a referral source or something, somebody that helps your business. Yeah. Well, at first it starts with just being, being a human and being genuine and authentic and just like going, going after it. Like you would like, Hey, I really want to meet this person. They could be, uh, I don't know, a friend. Like, and that was the cool part about moving to Denver is I didn't know a soul. My wife and I didn't know anybody. So honestly, I kind of was looking for friends to be honest with you. And so um, that's how I approached it at first. But then the the main main question that I would always ask these business owners that I was getting connected with was, what what is it that I could do to help you grow your business? Mm -hmm. And I quickly learned that there was a lot of things that I could do. Even though I was very green in the business world, there was a lot of things that I could be doing, like, like sharing their stuff on social media, liking their stuff on social media. When they, when they have different events for their stuff, show up. Um, and actually, here's the big one, is actually try to actively send them referrals. Like That's a huge one. I, I, I told my guy who I just hired, who's taking over my practice, we just, I just sold my practice here in Denver. And I told him, I was like, look, some of these docs, some of these concierge doctors, 
if you can send them one client, just one, you will be their best friend. <laughs> you will be their absolute best friend because no PTs do that. Right. No, I guarantee you they do. <clears throat> part, of, part of the thing that I teach, which is called the doctor referral strategy, which is essentially has nothing to do with asking doctors to send you patients right? Like that's like the last thing you want to do. The first thing you want to do is send them patients. And the moment you start doing that and, you're, and you, you have a reason to call them on the phone and be like, Hey, I just sent you, uh, I just sent you Sally. I just was hoping to just give you an update on her case or whatever. And that is the, you know, kicking in reciprocity obviously is like, is so key. Yeah. But there's, there's a part two to that strategy too, right? Is that when you ask them that question, which is, uh, you know, what can I do for your business? And then they ask you that back. What's the obvious answer is to say, oh, you can send me some patients, but that's not the best answer. That's the obvious answer, but, but that is not the best answer. I think the best answer is, is to basically what I used to say is, um, do you have anybody that you could connect me with mm. that, would be, that would be a good person that could help me to grow my business? Um, I used to say this all the time. I was like, honestly, do you, just have, do you know any like movers and shakers? Do you know anybody that are doing amazing things in this city? I would love to connect with them. Yeah. I think the, the growing of the network, I mean, it sounds to me like you have, you have figured out that, that, that sort of pathway and understanding how important those relationships are and not just the medical relationships, but just the community relationships. And that, that's a great way because as you like, I mean, word of mouth is like just so important in our industry. And I think it's overlooked a little bit. We always think about marketing in terms of advertising, but we, we tend not to think about it in terms of, well, how do you leverage relationships as a whole to bring people into your practice? Exactly. And that's actually where it gets fun as well is, is yeah, I see high level executives and CEOs of companies and that's great. But I also get referrals for the 14 year old baseball player. Mm -hmm. I also get referrals for the 90 year old woman who wants to work out with me. Um, you know, like those are cool to, to filter in though. They just continue to pile on your business. And so yeah, expanding your network and, um, yeah, of course, you know, having a niche and avatar, I know that's kind of, um, be like a dead horse in, in our, in our realms these days, but it's, it's very important, but at the same time, um, continuing to expand your networks as well in, in, in all different areas. I agree. I'm sort of with you. Like I, I hear a lot about the importance of niche building. In fact, I interviewed Christine Walker, um, who is the, you know, the niche marketing master of websites and, uh, you know, I am a generalist. I think we treat everything. We treat the 90 year old, we treat the 14 year old ACL, we treat vestibular, we treat some light and narrow, we treat just general ortho, the weekend warrior, anything primarily because I get bored as shit. And like, I just, I like seeing a variety of people. If I saw the same damn thing every day, I think I'd become exhausted and tired and burnt out really fast. Um, but you know, the, I, I think that it, niching is, is one way to do something. And it's a really good way to do something, but it's not the only way to build a business. And, you know, and I think especially like you started out treating only feet, <laughs> like, you know, that, that can get pretty, pretty boring pretty quickly. It's um, terrible. Let's change gears for a second. So you sold your practice. So let's, let's get into that because that to me, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of clinicians, um, young PTs, again, are going the cash pay route. And one of the things that I always caution them against is there's, there's, two, there's two problems with the cash pay model as a whole. Number one is it's not recession proof. And that, um, you know, God forbid, we don't know what the political climate looks like, you know, in the future. And we do hit another recession. Um, people's, people's health oftentimes, they, they do sacrifice things like personal training. They do sacrifice their, you know, going to trips to the doctor when they need to because of high copays and so forth. And so a cash PT model um, is a little bit more, susceptible to a recession than let's say a fully insurance model. Um, you know, at the moment we're a hybrid model, we're somewhere in the middle because I believe in this diversification that we have a lot of cash pay patients and we have a couple of insurance pay patients. But, and then the other thing that I caution them against is what's your exit strategy? How do you get out of the business? Because it's very difficult to sell a cash based business because everybody wants to see you, but you have successfully done that. So I want to hear the story behind how you actually figured out how to sell a cash based business. Yeah. Well, well, number one, I, I'd love to share this because I do feel like what we've been able to create here and, and I've got a PT named Jordan that's taking over. I do feel like it's, it's pretty much as close as you could get to recession proof. Okay. Um, because I actually started looking over my numbers and this actually blew my mind and I'm the owner is about 98% of our income over the last three years has come from 42 patients, just okay. 42. That's it. Um, and we've built incredible relationships with them. 
And, um, and, and they, they are the types of patients, even if they fall off, whether they go on vacation or they leave town, because those are lots of the types of clients that we see, um, when they come back, they still, you know, they've got either a new issue that they want us to address or, right. or they want to be able to work in more of a wellness fashion and be, and be trained by us physical therapists. Um, so that's number one. Number two is I'll tell you, it's not an easy thing to sell, especially a concierge practice being mobile. You don't have a physical location. That's, that's tough to sell. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I had a lot of people, a lot of people that I, that I uh, genuinely value their advice tell me like, Josh, this is going to be a hard sell. Um, and, and I'll be honest, it, it was, but all I had to do was find the right person for it. Um, and I was, we were able to come up with a deal that I thought was fair for both, both parties. And is it working um, out a buyout scenario or is it a, is it a, do you keep a percentage of the business? I mean, if it's anything you don't have, you, you don't have to disclose details or whatever, but. Oh no, it's all good. Um, so yeah, basically it was a, model. yeah, it was basically a business assets uh, agreement purchase. Um, and so that's the main thing that you could buy with this types of type of business is you're basically buying the client load. That's, that's right. what you're buying. Um, so it was a business asset purchase agreement is what it turned out to be. Um, and, and it turned out to be, t- turned out to be great for both of us. And, and the greatest thing about it is so far we've got a hundred percent retention as well, because oh, that's, that's, that's what a lot of lawyers told us is, Hey, dentist practices, uh, financial advisor practices. We usually typically expect at least a 40% drop off. And we haven't, we, over the course of the last month and a half, two months, we've seen a hundred percent retention. So How did you do that? Did you bring the new PT on sessions with you and introduce them? Like what was the transition period like? Yeah. So he's worked his butt off. He's been doing home health as well, but he's been okay. pretty much at all visits with me and he's not getting, he wasn't getting paid for that. Um, okay. <laughs> we, we just knew that this was extremely important for him to, to do this and to build these relationships. And so basically we did it two ways. He first started just shadowing me and then I quickly um, had him actually start treating and I, and I just watched him because mm. I did not want my patients to feel like I didn't trust him. Mm. Um, so we, qu- we quickly got him in there and started working with the patients and doing some of the things that I was doing, but he was the one treating and I would just sit back and watch and, and have conversations and joke around with people. <laughs> right. <laughs> At what point did you start revenue sharing with him before he actually bought the business once he started treating? Um, yeah. So once he started taking over patients full time, um, there were some patients that were immediately on board and they were like, Josh, I'm fine with this Jordan guy. Like, you go take off to Texas. <laughs> and, so, and so we, we quickly transitioned those patients, but then there were other ones that honestly, um, you know, had a tough time with it. Maybe we're a little bit, uh, not too, too satisfied with, with me taking off to Texas. Um, sure. and so it took some time to, to, uh, basically help them to understand and let them know that, Hey, I, I, I really took some time to choose the best possible PT to come in to do this. And so it was quite the process, but those patients that he started with, um, he started getting paid uh, for those immediately. Right. Do you ever get issues in people's homes? You know, like, I think that's probably one of the things that people worry about with like home health in general. And then like, concierge is not immune to this, but you know, like, you know, dogs barking, kids screaming, you know, like spousal problems. Like how often do you run into that stuff? And then, and then how do you, how do you generally, I mean, I actually read something on the, on the PT, was it mobile PT? Uh, group page. I don't know. Something about like, how do you deal with someone who's a smoker, you know, and you go and you do, you do a session in their home and you leave and the rest of the day, you smell like cigarettes. It's like, do you take that patient? You get rid of that patient. What do you do? There's gotta be those issues along the way. Yeah, man, I'd have a tough time with that one. I'm not going to lie. Smoke, smoke for me is like, uh, I'll blame it on my asthma, but I, I can't stand it. <laughs> um, luckily, luckily we don't have any patients that smoke. Um, I don't, I don't know how, how that happens. To be honest with you, I'm from Texas a lot more people smoke in Texas than they do in Colorado. Right. Um, Colorado is just very health conscious. So that's probably the only reason that we've gotten away with that probably. Um, but yes, I've run into some situations. I've been bitten by a dog before. Um, he was, <laughs> it was a little dog, but gave me a huge gash in the ankle. Okay. Um, you know, but the, but the family was really nice about it. And, uh, they, you know, they made sure I was okay. And, uh, anyway, it, it turned out to be fine. They just now keep that dog up whenever we come by. Um, other things is, yeah, there's been, there's been issues. Like, uh, honestly, there was, there was one time that, that I was seeing a couple actually, mm-hmm. and they would have a personal trainer come at the same time and blare loud music while I worked with one and then the other. And then, and then the, the, the personal trainer was always like 
kind of looking over my shoulder and seeing what I was doing. And I, here's the biggest thing that I can tell everybody that's listening is for those situations, it's just best to confront it and have that conversation right away. And right. so I just had the conversation with him. I said, look, I just don't think that this is the best. At, I, you guys are paying me a lot of money and, and this is not the best atmosphere for you to get the best results, to be honest with you. And right. they ultimately, they ultimately left. Um, they, I, I told them it was probably best if they just continued with their personal trainer. It was okay. that kind of a bad situation. And so, um, you know, you've got to do what you got to do and don't be afraid to miss out on money and continue to push through a bad situation. Um, right. because ultimately it's all about our patients. Think about what is the best situation for them. If they've got kids screaming in the background and it's, it's difficult for you to focus and work with them and truly get the most out of it, have that conversation and see if there's just small tweaks that could be done. And when you hear concierge, you sort of think about the idea that you're on call. Um, I know that we, I actually treat a number of different physicians, a couple of orthopedists and, and, and two of them are concierge, uh, MDs. And, um, you know, they've, they actually work with a, a concierge MD company that actually manages the entire concierge process, which I thought was really interesting. But you, you hear these, this idea that like, as a concierge medicine practitioner, someone literally has your cell phone, you know, they can literally be on the golf course, call you up and be like, Hey, Dr. Payne, could you come stretch me before my, <laughs> you know, that's like, like, that's like what a lot of us picture when we think of concierge is like, you are on someone's beck and call. Is, is that a reality or is that a false belief? That is a false belief, definitely. Okay. But, but it depends on the clinician. So I'll tell you my first year, all I wanted to do was have success. And what do we do as PTs? We run ourselves ragged. Hey, you want to be seen at 8 p.m.? Great, I'll be there. You know, um, I had to set myself actual hours and, and like actual eight to five hours really to start. And, and if people could only be seen after hours, I had to say, look, I'm sorry. Um, but, but that's just not going to work because that's when I spend time with my family. Um, and so I actually had to start putting myself first. And I tell this to a lot of, a lot of my students is, Hey, this is your time with your own practice that you have to be a little bit selfish because if you're not, you're going to let your clients really rule your schedule versus, versus you actually taking charge of your schedule. Right. All right. We got two more things to talk about. One is the book. And two is the coaching program, <laughs> both of which are freaking awesome. I'm writing a book right now. It's an effing beast. And writing a book sucks. <laughs> it, is, it is such a difficult thing to do. I mean, I'm writing a tactical manual on, on PT. So it's like there's so much that goes into it. And um, you delivered your book at SSPT. I was like, ah, God, I need to have my book ready. <laughs> I was so upset at myself when it wasn't done yet. So tell me, tell me about the book. Tell me real quick about the writing process, whether you, you self-published it, whether you got someone else to publish it, and then, uh, and then we'll move in. We'll finish up with talking about the, the coaching that you're now doing. Yeah, so the, uh, I appreciate it. The Concierge PT Success Formula is my book. Um, and I, yeah, it was quite the process first. Um, it really, over the course of time, really, it, it took me about six months um, but it had been almost like a two year thing coming up until that point. Um, I had a lot of stuff that I continued to write down. Um, and it finally just came, came, came into one tight package when I finally just set myself a goal of SSPT live, yep. I just got it done. Um, so SS, I, I think, I think that book, I, I think Greg Todd and SSPT live because it really gave me that succinct goal. Like, Hey, like I better get this done. And, and Greg Todd actually challenged me and said, Josh, get it done. <laughs> and that was, that was really what it took. And so, um, it, man, it's quite the process. You know, honestly, my, my book is only 108 pages. I wanted to make it a guide that somebody could quickly read in a weekend because I truly believe that when uh, we, sometimes we, we all take a very long time to get through, through books. And if, yep. if you're reading it over the course of three months, you're not going to get as much out of it as you would if you just read it in a weekend. Um, so I wanted to make it kind of that short read and I've had people tell me, Hey, I, I read the entire thing at the beach or I read the entire thing on a flight home over the weekend. And like, that's, that's awesome to me. And, and to be able to maybe go through it again and really get that information. That's what I was looking for was a succinct little guide basically. Um, and I'm actually, I feel for you, Jared, because I'm in the process of writing my second book. Okay. Um, I, and uh, I, I haven't told anybody about that, but I'm just letting you know, I, I 100% feel for you because it's, man, it really is a process, but I did self-publish. That's the, the answer to your second question. Yeah. So when you, when, you, when you have the books printed, they're printed on demand? 
they they are printed on demand, but um, but yeah, as as a self publisher on Amazon KDP, um, you can order author copies, and so I've actually got a massive box right here with filled with about two hundred copies that I send people off when they buy them, uh, um, and I just keep a big stash here at my home because author copies um, you can get for significantly less as well. Ah. All right, we'll talk about that more offline because <laughs> yeah. we had the book out. And then lastly, you know, um, th- th- this, this podcast, this show is, is not just about helping, like almost like exposing young clinicians to different, um, different pathways, uh, different people who've had success in different areas, not just to give them ideas, but to give them motivation. At least, Look, this isn't that hard. Like it's hard but anyone can do it. It's kind of like that movie Ratatouille, you know, where the big fat chef is like, anyone can cook, you know, it's like <laughs> anyone, anyone can really do this if you've got passion and you've got the heart for it and you've got the mindset for it. Um, and, you know, and it's awesome that you've actually gone through this entire journey. You went from working as a staff clinician, six jobs in four years, and then you went the home health route and you were like, this still sucks. And you said, I need my time. And you went into concierge then you wrote a book on concierge and now you're into the, into coaching. And it's, it's awesome because, you know, th- when you're, when you're really young and you're a clinician and you're, and you're working four or five patients an hour and you feel that grind and there's all that pressure and you really don't know what you're doing yet as a clinician. And there's all these patients and you feel overwhelmed. I think we all kind of get, you know, early on in our, our career into this, this feeling of hopelessness, you know, where there's just, there's no way out. There's, there's, you're never going to be happy. You're never going to be satisfied. Um, and it's awesome to see people who've almost like escaped the matrix, you know, who are living outside of that, of that world. So take us into the last step of the journey now into the coaching. Yeah. So I've got, I've got basically two, two coaching programs. I've got uh, a three month coaching program, which is basically for those new ther- those new concierge physical therapists that are looking to take basically this idea of having a concierge practice and, and take as much action and, and get as far as possible in the course of three months. And the amazing thing that I've learned with this, I'm actually about to enter into my class number four starts in mid September. Okay. Um, and what I've learned from the first three classes is, man, so much can happen in, in the course of three months. If you're laser focused and dialed in and dedicated to it, giving yourself a goal of three months to really, to really make a massive change in your life is pretty incredible. Now, now I'm not saying you're going to have a full caseload of 20 patients, but, uh, but some amazing things have happened in that. And then and then other than that, I have my mastermind, which is, is clearly a year long program. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's basically for these people with concierge practices that want to want to be able to take it to the next level and take it to the level of having it become a full time opportunity for them, maybe even hiring patients and then maybe also even uh, starting online online businesses as well, like I've done. Um, that's kind of in a nutshell what we do in the mastermind. Have you been finding the, the, the coaching people? Do you, do you run ads? Is it, do they find you? Like, how do you, how do you bring people into the coaching model right now? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's primarily through, um, Facebook, which, uh, mm-hmm. Facebook, my Facebook group, the concierge physical therapist. And then also, um, just from, uh, you know, normal Facebook, uh, conversations that I have with people. And then yes, we do run Facebook ads primarily, just to um, help get the, get the book into more people's hands to, to help more PTs understand that this is a viable model that you can do in your town or city as well. And then the next step is I just want to start informing um, young clinicians, you know, even students that this is a, this is an opportunity for them. So my next big step is, is I've, I've contacted a lot of universities and gotten some good feedback so far about, about getting to get in there and talk with their students about it as well. Oh, that's awesome. I think, yeah, I mean, if you can sort of get them really, really early on thinking about all these different opportunities, you know, I, hopefully that'll avoid that, that moment of, of, of hopelessness and burnout really early in their career because they know, oh, there's this, this North Star out there and that's, that's what I'm moving towards, which is really cool. Exactly. If people want to find you and get in touch with you, if they want to uh, get a copy of the book, how do they do that? Yeah. So best way I'm, I'm always on Facebook. It's just Josh Payne on Facebook. Um, and then on Instagram, it is at the concierge PT. You can reach out to me either way. Um, people reach out to me all the time through Facebook messenger. That's a great way to do it. And then, um, I could always send you a link to the book. We're actually still doing a current special basically where all you got to do is just pay shipping and handling anywhere in the U S I've already bought the books for you and, and we'll send it off to you. In fact, they're sitting on your desk right now. 
Yep, they're sitting in, in, a, in a large box <laughs> right there. Yeah. In fact, if you call in right now, Josh is going to box up a book and send it to your house as we speak. <laughs> That's right. I'd love to. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Good luck in Texas. Good luck on the move. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. Talk soon.